أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته so we'll start from where we left we are in the middle of auditing the inventory process and the three things we're going to discuss today are segregation of duties and its reasons the inherent risks and the test of controls so let's just jump into it the cost accounting as we discussed the activity of cost accounting should be segregated from everything else the inventory management which we discussed in our last class the inventory storage and the general ledger and the reasons are as follows the first reason for this segregation is to prevent manipulation of production and inventory costs remember the idea of segregation of duty is to have more than one individual or more than one department if possible be involved in actually doing the work and doing the recording of the transaction when you separate them if there is an error caused by one it will be catch it will be caught by the other party and it makes fraud more difficult so manipulation of production and inventory costs nobody can just go and change them to make things look better than they are right because multiple people are involved the cost accounting is done by somebody inventory is stored inventory is stored by someone else right cost accounting is done by somebody the inventory handling and transfer is done by someone else cost accounting is done by somebody and the final recording of the items in the general ledger is done by someone else the second reason is this may lead to an over or understatement of inventory and net income so as you can understand the miscalculation of any one of the inventory items either direct indirect any of the costs fixed or variable if it is miscalculated by one individual and they are the only people responsible then you could have an overstatement or an understatement of inventory which would least lead to the overstatement or understatement of cost of goods sold ultimately resulting in a wrong net income and if you have multiple people involved like we have in the segregation of duties like the segregation of dis duties prescribed then we would have the mistake caught by someone even if the mistake is made by someone else okay some more reasons of the segregation are the prevention of unauthorized shipments to cover up cover up the uh, theft of goods and uh, the prevention of concealment of unauthorized shipments so before the items are shipped to the customer they are authorized by the supervisor or the manager and if they are shipped before authorization or if they are stolen during the shipment process then if the same person is also doing the record keeping recording the inventory then they can manipulate the inventory records to show that the item is still there it was not stolen when where in reality the item is no longer there or the item was shipped without authorization they could manipulate the records to show that it was not so the segregation of duties give you that safety net and this can also result uh, in theft of goods leading to an overstatement of inventory so this is all a somewhat repeat of the item that we discussed before uh, theft of goods can take place if the same person is responsible for making sure remember they don't have to be the one stealing but they're responsible if someone is responsible to make sure that nothing is stolen and it is stolen while they are on guard then if they are also changing or, or, or have access to change the records then they can show the records uh, manipulate the records to hide the theft so if there were 50 boxes and the record shows there are 50 boxes let's say five of those boxes were stolen if they have access to changing the 50 boxes to 45 they can change that and show that they only had 45 boxes and the other five boxes were not there right whereas five were there and they were stolen so seg separ segregating the duties uh, does not give them the luxury to change the records without authorization right so this is you know somewhat common sense uh, does it make sense are you following does this make sense are you with me
Okay, very good. Now we move on to the auditor side of the activities. The inherent risks are the first we test and valuation of inventory is one of the inherent risks. What is the value of the inventory? Now have you heard something called lower of cost or market? This is something that you have heard before also known as LCM. This is something that you should have been exposed to in the financial intermediate and advanced financial accounting classes. Have you heard of this? Lower of cost of mar or market? Lower of cost or market. I'm sorry, it's just lower of cost or market. Right. So what is the concept? Let's say you buy a barrel of oil for $50 and the market price goes up to $60. You have to report it at 50. Okay, that is the lower of the two. But let's say you buy a barrel of oil for $50 and the market price goes below 50, it goes to 40, then you have to report it at 40, whichever is lower, right? That is the value of the inventory. This is the idea of lower of, co lower of cost or market. And sometimes there is a dispute, there is a disagreement between the auditor and the accountant of the client as to what is the value of the inventory, right? And this could be a complicated issue if you cannot come to an agreement with the client. So this is an inherent risk in the financial statement reporting because if it is not reported following the accounting method then the inventory is showing higher than what it should show inventory amount is higher than what it should show is that clear are you following the idea this is an inherent risk because it's difficult to come to agreement with the client's accountant the next is obsolescence of inventory if the inventory becomes obsolete so let's say the client has items that are in the inventory but they're obsolete meaning those inventory items cannot be sold anymore they're useless or they're out of date or they're out of fashion or they cannot be uh, then you know the technology is too old so these items cannot be sold anymore so these inventory items if they're still in the balance sheet they should be removed and the loss should be recognized the third is small expensive items that are susceptible to theft. For example, if your client is in the diamond industry, a handful of diamond, a pocket full of diamond could be worth a massive amount of money. So it can be stolen very, very easily, right? So this is something that could manipulate their inventory records if they have expensive small items that can be stolen easily. Number four, related party transactions. Buying inventory from related parties. For example, the company buys spare parts from a subsidiary or the company that sells the, sub the, the spare parts is owned by the brother of the CEO or the cousin of the CFO. That means there may be transactions between the two companies that are not following all the conventional transaction policies if it was done between two third parties, two independent parties. So you have to be very careful if they have related party transactions to make sure that all those transactions are recorded at the proper amount and the transaction terms are also reasonable. Okay, so this is an inherent risk. And then, of course, prior year misstatement is always an inherent risk. If you found a mistake in the financial statement in the previous year in a particular place, then you might find it again. So you have to be careful with prior year misstatements. Okay? Any questions on the inherent risks? Okay. Now we move on to the test of controls. The first management assertion that is tested is occurrence. Now, occurrence means everything that is recorded, everything that is recorded
what word am I looking for? Everything that is recorded. Anyone? Happened, happened, very good. So we want to make sure that everything they have recorded actually happened. So recorded inventory exists. The inventory is recorded, is it there? And after they have recorded, was it stolen? So what we want to make sure is they have proper segregation of duties. So we observe the segregation of duties. We ask, we say, who does this and who does that? And if we are happy with the segregation, that means everything is smooth. Account for numerical sequence of materials requisition. Remember, I showed you the materials requisition document in our last class. The materials requisition docu document is created by the factory and it goes to the inventory warehouse. Inventory items are issued from the inventory warehouse to the factory based on the materials requisition. We want to make sure the client accounts for every single materials requisition document, materials requisition form. They ha they're numbered. They have a sequence of numbers and we want to make sure that nothing is missing so that they account for all the inventory. Because inventory when it's transferred has a higher possibility of being misplaced or stolen. So we want to know what is the procedure for transferring the inventory from the warehouse to the factory? What is the process of issuing materials for manufacturing so that the items are not misplaced? The items are not stolen, right? Everything that they have recorded still is in the inventory and not missing. Okay? You can ask me if you have questions. I will continue, inshallah. The next is completeness. So completeness is everything that happened is, what is the word I'm looking for? Everything that happened is, when it comes to completeness, recorded, is recorded. Very good. Excellent. So we want to make sure the inventory that is received, that was received, was recorded properly. And what we want to test here is observe the physical safeguard over the inventory. So we want to make sure that the inventory is physically guarded, right? And we want to review the test, review and test client's procedures for consignment goods. What is consignment goods? Consignment goods are inventory items that are at your client's location, but they belong to someone else. So understand the, uh, understand the concept. Let's say you are auditing Baladna and Baladna has some bottles of milk in Lulu's refrigerator and Baladna will only get paid once those bottles of milk are sold. So now the physical location of the bottles of milk are at Lulu but in whose balance sheet should be this this inventory? In whose balance sheet should this inventory be recorded? It should be recorded in Baladna's inventory. It is physically at Lulu, but Baladna did not sell it to Lulu yet. It's just there for the customers to buy. Baladna will take the money once the customer buys. This is called consignment inventory. So if you're auditing Lulu, you want to make sure that this is not included in the balance sheet because it belongs to Baladna. If you're auditing Baladna, you want to make sure that the inventory that is sitting in Lulu is included in Baladna's inventory. Is that clear? So you have to ask them, you have to ask them about the consignment good. Because if it's not there at their physical location, you don't know if they have milk in Lulu. Because you're not going to Lulu's location when you're auditing Baladna, right? So if Baladna tells you that, yes, we have inventory in Lulu and this is where it is, then you can go to Lulu and check that inventory. Are you following? Is that clear? So we want to make sure that that inventory is completely recorded in Baladna's records. Okay. The next is authorization. We are worried about unauthorized purchase when they're buying inventory. And we are also worried about production activity leading to excess finished goods. So we want to make sure that the purchase is authorized and the production is authorized. Because if they produce 
more than what they can sell, then it will lead to excess finished goods. Excess finished goods have many problems. Number one, if it is perishable goods, then it will expire and you have to throw it away. If it is high tech inventory, then it will become outdated very soon because the next technology will come. Even if it is inventory that you can sell and it will not expire, it will still cost you money to store it. And when you store inventory for long term, it has the possibility of being damaged or stolen or misplaced. So you want to make sure that the client has a proper way of authorizing the inventory and they only authorize inventory as much as they need, as much as they can sell with a little bit left over. So the process you test, number one, review authorized production schedules. Now I showed you the production, an example of a production schedule. The production schedule should be authorized before they start producing. You want to ask what is the procedure? How do you authorize production schedules? Can I look at a few production schedules and see when it was prepared, when it was authorized, and when the actual production took place? And then you also want to review and test procedures for developing inventory levels and procedures used to control them. So inventory levels, meaning how much of product X should, it, should they have available for sale, how much of products Y should they have available for sale? You want to ask, how do you determine this? What is the process, right? Is it based on how many you can sell? Is it based on your production capacity? Is it based on how fast the items expire? What is the procedure of developing the inventory levels? Just by telling you that we want to have 100 boxes of this and 200 boxes of that and 500 bo boxes of that is not enough. You want to ask them, why, is it, why do you determine this should be 100? How do you figure out that it should be 200 based on what? And the answer that they give you will tell you the inventory method they use and it will also tell you are, if they're using the right inventory method or not. Remember, we studied the inventory ordering methods, economic order quantity, just in time, materials requirement planning. Do you remember in the, audit, the AIS class? The AIS class, we, we studied this. Do you remember? Okay. Now we go to the next management assertion, which is accuracy. Our concern as auditors is price quantity, price or quantity of recorded inventory and cost of goods sold. Here we are worried about the numbers being accurate. So you can imagine how much calculation and cost accounting takes place in calculating these items. So we want to review the reconciliation of perpetual inventory records. Remember, perpetual inventory is something that you studied in the intermediate classes. There are two methods primarily. One is perpetual and the other one is, who can remember? What is the other one? What is the other inventory method? Who can remember? Periodic. Excellent. Sharat. Excellent. So we don't necessarily have to remember how to calculate the periodic or perpetual here. What we have to understand as auditors in this class is that we want to ask the client, what is the process of your inventory reconciliation when it comes to your perpetual inventory? And we want to review and test procedures for taking physical inventory. Every business takes physical inventory, counts the actual physical inventory and matches it with the recorded inventory at least once a year. Some in businesses do many more times, right? Some businesses might do weekly. So we want to ask them, what is the process? When do you do? How many times do you do? What is the process? And it usually, the physical inventory count is usually done during a slow production period. So when the production is slow, when the inventory is not rapidly moving from raw material to work in process to finished goods, when it is slow, it is easier to take physical inventory because by the time you finish raw material inventory counting, it may have moved to work in process and you may count it again, right? So you want to know when is it counted. Usually, the physical inventory at supermarkets and other places are counted at a time when there are not many customers so that they are counted 
when the inventory is not moving. You want to know what is your client's procedure. The procedures used to develop standard costs. Now standard costs are known by industry experts and if you're auditing a particular industry you would know the standard costs. For example, let me ask you something. If a pizza sells for ten dollars, what is the cost of food in that? Just a question, take a guess, an educated guess. If the pizza is selling for ten dollars, if you buy the pizza as a customer for ten dollars, what is the cost of food so cost of foods food in that? Cost of food. How much is the cost of food? Which is the cost of goods sold? How much is it? Can you take a guess? Two dollars? Any other guesses? Any other guesses? Just the cost of food, just the cost of food, the food that you're seeing in front of you when the pizza arrives, what is the cost of that? If you're paying $10 for the pizza, what was the cost of the pizza store of the food that you see in front of you? five those are good estimates cost of food is usually three dollars and fifty cents right cost of labor for that one pizza is usually two dollars and fifty cents location cost is usually one dollar advertising cost is usually one dollar and other costs is usually one dollar so what is the net income from one pizza the ten dollar pizza what is the net income one dollar right so if they sell 500 pizzas a day right if they sell 500 pizzas a day right then the daily net income from that is how much? The daily net income from that is 500. The monthly net income is monthly net income is fifteen thousand, right? Fifteen thousand dollars, right? Fifteen thousand dollars monthly net income, which is how many reals? Fifteen thousand dollars is how many reals? Is that bad? If you own a pizza store, after paying everybody, the labor and the food and everything, is that a bad income? Monthly income? Would you take it? Is that good? It's good, right? If you sell five five hundred pizzas you'd be able to make. But what I'm trying to show you is the standard cost. This standard cost that I have listed for you is something that you would only know if you are in the industry. You cannot take guesses and know what it is. You follow. This is the, the cost that I gave you applies to a standard US location, not in Qatar. Qatar, the cost for uh, operating it in Qatar is different. Okay. So, uh, there are stores shut up that sell more, right? They're, that sell more than that on an average daily. So you can make, right? You can make, for example, the financial statements I showed you, right? The financial statements I showed you. Let me show you the real financial statement that I showed you the other in another class. It's a real store. So. Uh, 
Let me show it to you again. It's loading, just give me one second. So this is the income statement, right? And as you can see, look at the period ending, right? Look at the sales. This is the sales, right? This is for this is for one. This is for one month. So 147,000, right? 147,000. Uh, this is for 2019. 2020 is 180,000. So divide 180,000 with 10. This is for one month. Divide 180,000 with $10. How many pizzas did they sell? Eighteen thousand, right? How many did they sell daily? Six hundred, right? You follow? You see the cost of food. This is third. You see thirty-eight here, right here in two thousand nineteen is thirty-four point seven four, which is about three point five, right? If it's hundred, that's thirty-five percent. So this, you know, what I told you, three point five cost of food sold, uh, cost of food sales. You see the labor about 2.5. You see that 25%. So if we come to the net income, if we go to the net income, right? The net income is a little bit off in this particular case in the uh, customers financial statement because they have something called an administrative wage so they have something called an administrative wage which they take from their uh, location but if you look at the different standard costs you will see that they equal to what I told you okay so for example this royalty right this is something that the owners are taking which is 5.5 percent right and they also charge this company more uh, for advertising for example here you see they're charging large amounts for advertising but if we look at the consolidated company it's a bit complicated but just to show you the number that actually matters is if we come down here look at the operating profit right look at the operating profit this is the number we are after you see this you see that number uh, Sharat it's about 10 percent right it's about 10 percent which is one out of ten. If ten dollar pizza gives you one, so it's about close to fifteen thousand. Do you follow what I'm saying? This is the number we want to look at. So based on what I showed you, right? This is monthly. Okay. This is monthly. This is a real store. This is a, from from uh, last year. So anyhow, you get the idea. So we come to the standard cost business now is if we have standard costs right if we know the standard costs we would be able to see whether the financial statements are showing or, or, or I'm sorry we want to ask the client the procedures used to develop the standard cost so we want to know how does the client develop the standard costs and if we are satisfied that means they have accurate record keeping we also want to know the process of cost accumulation and variance reports. Remember the variance is what the standard or budgeted cost is and what the actual is. So remember the financial statement that I showed you 9.59% uh, operating profit and the standard is 10%.
Would that be satisfactory with you? Instead of 15,000, they have 14,000 something. The variance is a few hundred dollars. Is that, would, would you be able to live with that? Is that okay with you? Would you be satisfied with that? Or is that going to ring a bell and say something is wrong? You would be okay with it because it's very close. You follow, right? Now, we want to look at the client's procedure of looking at the variance. And the procedures for identifying obsolete inventory. Obsolete inventory are those items you cannot sell anymore. You want to know how does your client identify the obsolete inventory. You also want to know how do you, does your client identify slow moving items, items that sit in the inventory for a long time. The reason you want to know that is because sometimes slow moving inventory could expire or go out of date very quickly. And then you also want to know how does your client identify excess quantities, right? Excess quantities. So you want to make sure that those items are tracked and if they become outdated they're removed from the inventory records so that the inventory record is accurate and again we are not doing substantive procedures we're still in the test of controls we want to know what is the client's procedure of taking care of this are you following is that clear okay now we go to the next which is cut off. Inventory recorded in the improper period, right? Inventory recorded in the improper proper period. The test of control is to review and test procedures for processing receiving report into perpetual inventory records. So there are two places where the inventory is added and removed that are regular. The first one is when the inventory arrives and you have the receiving report, you add it to the inventory. And the second is removing inventory from perpetual uh, records based on shipment. So the other one is when you ship the goods. You want to make sure that the inventory is added when the actual inventory is received, which is from the uh, receiving report. And you want to make sure the inventory is removed from the records when you have a shipping document. You want to ask the client about their procedure. By the way, have you seen seen the ship, the picture of the ship that was stuck in the Suez Canal? Anyone else seen that ship? Those small blocks, ever given, yeah, those small blocks that you have, right? It's all over the news. It's all over the news, right? Let's just take a look at one of the images. That's some serious inventory. See this, these small blocks, right? These small blocks that you see here, these small blocks, these are those containers that come in those huge trucks that are on the street, right? That we see these small, one of these boxes, right? That you see, these are the, the small, this one right here comes in the back of a big truck. Are you following? These are the containers, right? That can contain all of the furniture that you have in a villa. This right here, right? That's some serious inventory. Now, just imagine the items were shipped from the seller and the items were supposed to be received by the buyer on a particular date, but the ship is stuck for seven days. Now what happens? Let's say it happened at the end of the year and the beginning of the following year. Just understand the inventory is removed from the seller and it has not been added to the inventory of the buyer. Do you follow? This is a real life example of the delay of the inventory from one place to the other. So you can see these type of real life problems 
could cause the accounting records to be looked at more carefully. You don't want to add anything that was not received yet, right? Even though it was supposed to have been received, right? You follow? So we want to make sure that the item is not recorded until it is received and the item is not removed until it is shipped. So we make sure that it is in the proper, it is in the proper period. And the last one is the classification, uh, which is the different types of inventory, raw material, work in process, and finished goods. We want to review the process uh, and forms used to classify inventory. We want to ask the client exactly when do you call the inventory raw material and exactly when it is no longer raw material and it is work in process. Same with the work in process. Until when is it, is it work in process? When do you start calling it finished goods? And you want to see whether you're satisfied with their answer so that the items are classified in the right category. Is that, is that clear? Are you following? They may start calling something finished goods and they may, the, the car may not have tires. Well, that's a problem because it's not finished goods, right? You follow? So you want to ask them, what do you call this? If you call it work in process, why is it included in the finished goods inventory? So you want to test their procedure to see uh, what they have and whether you're satisfied with it. And usually manufacturing companies that are sophisticated, they have very, very good you know, systems. You would be satisfied. You would be amazed to see how they keep track of the inventory. Okay. Now, just to improve your knowledge, I want to recommend a book. It is called The Great Game of Business. The name of the book is The Great Game of Business. You can do a Google search. I have this book, I have read this book, and this is a book uh, to have as a business executive to understand how business works, right? This is the book, The Great Game of Business by uh, Jack Stack, right? The name of the author is Jack Stack. He is sitting, as you see, on, a, on an engine. They have a company where they refurbish, they refurbish uh, old engines. So they buy old engines and they fix them and they resell them. And they have a very, very sophisticated way of running their business, calculating their inventories, calculating their supplies. Uh, this will increase your knowledge. It is a little bit technical, but none of you should be... Uh, having difficulty in understanding based on what knowledge you already have or should have. And this is something that you should keep, you should buy and you should keep as an accountant, as an auditor, as a business executive. And you should read frequently and you can get a lot of good ideas for running a business. And you should also get into the habit of reading books reading books that will increase your sharpness as a business executive and increase your sharpness as uh, managing your, uh, to manage your career. You can go and visit Borders uh, Bookstore and they have a whole section on business books. These are not textbooks and, you know, they're continuously, you know, books written. There are many books, you know, The Great Game of Business is one of them. Another one is... Uh, from good to great. Another one is build, build uh, to last, right? Built to last, I think. Built to last. And you will find a whole, you know, you will see the books that were uh, popular, that sold million, millions of copies. Those are the books that you should start with. And you should have a habit of reading. Uh, and you should know that if you read, if you read one hour every day about any subject for one year, listen to me, if you read about any subject one hour a day for one year, you will know better than 95% of the people about that subject. Your knowledge of that subject will be better than 95% of the people. So remember that, keep 
the habit of reading. All right? Any questions for me? Right? Power of daily. There you go. Power of daily. Right? Power of daily. Daily is a very powerful word. Right? And, you know, I, am, I say this and I try my best to practice it. Things that are important, trying to do them daily. For example, reading, right? Reading daily. And if it's something that you're, you know, not finding that exciting and interesting, read a little bit. Read two pages, right? Read two pages. But if you read two pages, in one year you would have read 700 pages, right? So just think about it. All right. So we'll stop here, inshallah. And I am going to see you, inshallah, on Thursday when we are going to discuss the simulation. Okay? I'm telling you all of these extra things, the side things, because your success, your career success is very important to me. I want all of you to have a successful and enjoyable career, right? You should not only have a career where you're successful, it should also be enjoyable. So I want you to find the enjoyment in what you do. Okay? And you can, you will discover this. Nobody can tell you this right now. You will discover it will evolve. Within the profession, there is a wide range of things that you can do. Okay? And you will find the right thing, inshallah. And I would like to help you, not just during the class, but beyond. So when you graduate, you, know, you stay in touch with me. And anytime you want to talk to me, anytime you, you want to discuss anything and need my advice, suggestion, etc., etc., I am here. And I would like for you to come back to me time and again. All right? I will see you, inshallah, on Thursday, inshallah. Okay? Have a very good day. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.